afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to the Government Affairs Forum. I'm Allison Hart, and I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce, and it's so nice to have all of you here today. And um, I love this topic today about education in our region and what is the vision of our leaders. And uh, we'll get more into this. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think this topic is important uh, to us that, that connects into all of the business world, and um, that will become clear in a moment. Um, as we get started, I would like to um, do a couple of thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And uh, Riverview Community Bank is our presenting sponsor, so thank you to them. And Casey was here a minute ago, but he seems to step up. But Larry is here, so Larry, raise your hand and be recognized, and thank you very much for Riverview. We have the Gresham Barlow School District, who has also been a longtime sponsor of the uh, Government Affairs Council. And we'd like to um, thank Chris Howitt the, uh, on the Board of Directors and Kathy uh, Ruth. Ruth, Ruth, excuse me, as well as Athena Vadness and, of course, Jim. And thank you very much for your support of our program. We also have PGE, and uh, Tom Nemmer and Dean Funk are here from PGE, so thank you for your support. Raise your hand and be recognized. Thank you. And Metro East Community Media, who has been our media sponsor for this event for some time, and they do tape this and rebroadcast our presentation, and so we really appreciate their partnership in our program. Again, I'd also like to thank our elected officials who are here, uh, Shirley Metro, uh, Shirley Craddock, <laughs> Metro Councilor. She is one of us. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Shirley, for being here. And um, uh, Lori Stegman of the Gresham City Council, so thank you for being here as well. I also have a variety of board members from the chamber in the room, so if you could just raise your hand and be recognized. We so appreciate the time and dedication and volunteerism from our board who helps drive the strategic direction of the chamber. So in terms of our program, I'm actually going to MC today. Um, Andre, who is our amazing uh, MC, who has such a plum at the, the microphone, it had a scheduling uh, conflict last minute this morning, so I'm going to be leading out our program. And part of why I think this program is so important is almost every conversation that I'm in, something comes up about workforce and workforce in education. Um, and earlier this week, I was uh, somewhere, and um, a representative from Boeing spoke and said that 50% of their workforce is eligible for retirement next year. 50%. Our other, one of our board members um, from Frontier uh, said that a third of his workforce retired last year. A third. And he has a third more that's eligible to retire this year. So when you think about that, that means there are going to be a lot of jobs available in our community. And what I keep hearing is that there's a skills gap between the jobs available and the workers that could fill them. And this is where education comes in. And this is why this is so important, um, is the skills gap. And this is why the focus on STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and math, and CTE, or career and technical education, are so important, as well as the governor's 40-40-20 plan. These are all things that are so pertinent for the U.S. to remain competitive uh, in the world market. Because if we don't step up on our education level, we will miss out and others will fill the gap where we are not doing that. And so that's part of how we came about our topic. So we want to know from our leaders uh, in, in education, what do these initiatives that I spoke about, how do they relate to business? So how does it relate to each of you in the room? What do these initiatives do for our community? And what do these initiatives look like in our schools? These are very, very important questions that we need to be asking ourselves on all levels, locally, at the state level, at the federal level, so that we can remain competitive in the world market. So with that, I'm going to just do a quick blurb about each of our speakers, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jim. We're so pleased today to have Linda Florence with us. She is the superintendent of the Reynolds School District, and I personally would like to thank Linda. She came here on her vacation to speak, and I so appreciate her doing that. Um, she has been the superintendent at Reynolds since July of 2012. So this is uh, our first opportunity to have her for the uh, chamber community, so thank you very much to be here. And prior to coming to Reynolds, um, Linda served as superintendent of the Inter Ontario and Culver School Districts and the director of curriculum and instruction at, and high school principal for the Central School District. So welcome. Thank you so much. 
We also has with us, have with us Sam Breyer, and he is the superintendent of the Centennial School District, also new to our community, so thank you for coming, Sam. And he has been the superintendent at Centennial since July of 2012 as well, and it's our, his first opportunity to speak in front of our chamber community. Um, prior to, his uh, to this assignment, he served as the assistant director for curriculum and student learning and the principal for Butler Creek Elementary School. So thank you for being here. And Dr. Michael Hay is also here. He's the president of Mount Hood Community College. And he has been the president since uh, July of 2011. Um, but he actually started out with his background in technology. So you bring a whole different uh, cadre to this table and it's very great to have your input here today. So thank you so much. And then last but definitely not least, we have Jim Schlachter, superintendent of the Gresham Barlow School District. Um, and Jim has been with Gresham Barlow since July of 2010. He's been, uh, before that, he was assistant superintendent and director of K-8 education, but he's also been such a fixture uh, in this community with many different roles, including uh, Gordon Russell Elementary School and Damascus Middle School principal. So thank you so much for orchestrating. And I do owe a special, special thanks to Jim because he really orchestrated our panel and pulled this together. So thank you. Well, in the ever-changing world of education, I guess it's a good thing to be called a fixture. That was meant in a nice way. No, I mean, I, I mean that in a nice way. It doesn't seem as though the tenure of these positions is particularly long. Um, you know, it feels a little bit like we're, we're in, a, in a setting that I'm used to here where you have candidates running for office, you know, and so you're always expecting them to, you know, kind of make a statement and then turn it over to somebody else to answer a difficult question. I think you'll, you'll see today, though, that it is exactly 180 degrees from that. One of the unique things, I believe, in my uh, years here in the Gresham Barlow School District is the increasing degree to which the three districts, Reynolds, Centennial, and Gresham Barlow, as well as Mount Hood, are working together, particularly around issues like career technical ed. So I want to frame up real quickly how we're going to go through that material and then kind of give you some some understanding of where the entry points are for questions and those kinds of things. We're going to try to answer the questions, first of all, uh, a lot by just telling our story of what actually is going on in our schools. Certainly there's always a good conversation to be had about what's the direction, what's the vis vision for the future. And we will start with that. Um, Michael Hay will talk a little bit about the Governor's 40-40-20 plan and how that relates to our community. Following that, Linda Florence uh, will talk a little bit about career technical ed, referred to as CTE. And she will share information from all three districts and community college. Michael will, at that time, also talk about the college's side of CTE. Following that, Sam Breyer will talk about ACE Academy, which is a, a great partnership between the three districts in terms of how that's addressing STEM and CTE. And then I'll speak a little bit about the Center for Advanced Learning, which is also an, another great example of a partnership that really gets at that higher level learning that's much more connected to the kinds of things that I, I believe the community is looking for in terms of transferable skills, knowledge, and, and understanding. And then we'll, we'll really at that point hopefully move through that quickly enough to where there's plenty of time for questions and answers that any one of us could probably answer. So that's kind of the frame. So with that, I will turn it over to Michael. And I think that's your clicker. Okay. Well, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Good, af good lunchtime, maybe is a better way to say it, I guess. Uh, thank you all for coming out today, and I appreciate having the opportunity to be with you for a little bit of this and join this illustrious crew up here in front. Um, so my task is to give you a little perspective on 404020. If you go back a couple of years ago and you look at the last biennium uh, that started up here, uh, the governor and the legislature decided we need to make a revolutionary design change, if you will, about education in the state of Oregon. And the whole notion of that was to make it the continuum of education, not just people that are graduating from high school going on to college or anything, but all the way from the youngest student that we have in our schools all the way to the oldest students that we have. And just to give you an example how that affects us at Mount Hood, my student body runs from literally prenatal students, that is babies in the wombs of mothers, all the way up to great grandparents. I think this year I have a grandparent uh, guy who's about a, um, no, he's a great grandparent. He's about 91 years old, and I've got a great grandmother who's about 88 years old. 
So, um, and then I get all the way down to those little youngsters we run in our Head Start programs and what. So we care about this continuum, and as such, we are working to our effort to partner with the rest of um, the educational partners in the area. But the 40-40-20 is a designation that says 20% of uh, the students uh, in the state will be high school graduates. 40% will be um, community college graduates or have a certificate of post-secondary education. And then the third 40 is that we will have 40% uh, baccalaureate or higher, so university degrees itself. And if you add all that up, that's 100%. And I think at the state level now, just when we start <clears throat> at the high school level, we don't see 100% of graduation coming through there. And so part of the thing is, how do we move that dial and move it on up to where 100% of the state is graduating? Now, you're hearing all sorts of news. I think Ted Wheeler just had a uh, comment about it in the paper and opinion article, uh, talking about the fact that you know the game is changing. There are lots of jobs out there, but unfortunately, they require more skills than what we've had. So you know, pretty much we're getting to the point where entry level is at the high school degree and post-sat becomes moving on. And so we need to prepare the workforce of the future and move into that. Now, when you look at these 40, 40, 20 things, um, we have a notion that um, we have these things called achievement compacts that help measure how we're doing on 40, 40, 20. Now, mine is slightly different than uh, the local superintendents, and the university is different than mine. But there's a similar concept in all of them, which says that, first of all, we want to push the connections between the various levels of education. That is, I care about partnering with the school districts as much as I care about partnering with the university, and I have goals in mind that are similar to what they have. So, for example, one of the goals I have in mind is how many students have nine units of uh, college uh, – uh, no, how many students we have enrolled in dual enrollment, and then they've got one of how many of their students uh, have nine units of college credit or more. So that gives us the connection. We have a goal about how many students we're transferring to the universities, uh, whereas the universities have their goal about how many are graduating out of theirs. So there's various numerical things like that that are pushing along, but they're pushing towards this notion of connection uh, between the various levels of education to make it a continuum. The second goal that we all have in there is to check on progress points. How, do, how well do students uh, advance? How well are they prepared for the next level of learning? And then how well do they move on? So for example, I have a measure in mind that says, uh, what percentage of your students are completing developmental math courses? What percentage of your uh, students are passing developmental writing courses and things along those lines? So it's a more of a progress point because one of the things we find as students progress and move into more accomplishments like 15 units, 30 units uh, at the college level, they have a propensity to go on and a propensity to graduate. So that's uh, part of what we're caring about there. And then the third area we all get into is, um, is the notion of completion. So remember the goal of 40-40-20 is 100% graduation. At my sector, we're trying to get into the 40%, have a community college degree or a certificate to go forward, and so we're promoting that completion. So that for me, and as well as for all of us, how many degrees we produce, how many certificates we produce, and trying to move that along. So um, that's the notion of 40-40-20. And then, um, you know, the, the goal is we have one of the best educated citizenry uh, of citizens in the world here in our state. And the other, the other notion about it is if you think about it from a business perspective, a living perspective, a taxpaying perspective up here, Oregon's uh, economy is based on the fact that people are working and when they are working, they pay taxes, payroll taxes or whatever else they're paying on there. Those taxes go into the hopper and allow us to provide for whatever services we need in the state of Oregon to run you know, that budget that Salem's going to kick out this year. And so we have a heavy investment in what's going on in Salem, how we're being funded, because it takes work to do that. In my case, and I would assume it's the same for the others, we need to redesign our educational plan. We've been all about access before. How many people want to come to our college? How many want to take various things, do different kinds of things? And we weren't necessarily concerned about degrees. Now with 404020, we do care about that degree completion and we're working on it. So one of the questions up there is how does 404020 benefit the business and, and chamber members? Well, we were involved in some economic modeling recently at the college up there, and we took it from, first of all, a business perspective. 
And with that business perspective there, we're looking to help with our graduates to raise consumer spending in the areas. We're also looking to generate new income for the area, and we're looking to create a skilled workforce. When you start to look at the combined activity that we do financially in ours, we have a multiplier effect with all that we pump into the economy. For example, I've got over 1,500 uh, people on my payroll that we do W-2s for. Uh, if you look at the salaries I pay and the amount that they spend in the Gresham or larger region area, it's pretty significant. Then I've got another 500 on my payroll and part-timers, so I've got a little over 2,000 W-2s I'm pushing out a year. So first of all, there's taxes that are going to the state uh, that are coming into the regional areas and uh, moving along at that particular uh, way. But if you look at what my students do, what they spend, what I spend on uh, salaries in the area, and then what we spend on goods and services in the area, we get about uh, an annual bump of about three quarters of a billion dollars coming into the Multnomah region and the area of our district that's coming in. So it's a pretty significant impact, and a lot of it's predicated in the fact that we have students, they do well, they progress, and they graduate. From the taxpayer, it's a pretty good investment. We're seeing that um, for every dollar that, the that individual taxpayers put in, there's about an 8.8% return for your dollar coming in in the forms of those dollars coming back into the economy and spending in the economy out there. Uh, also, from the student perspective, they will see almost a 30.8% return for every dollar that they invest in my institution in the form of increased wages when they go out there over the course of their lifetime. So this whole idea of going from 20% get that graduation uh, from the high school degree, come into me, there's all sorts of projections about what the incomes are of all these people as they move forward. Um, and then I think the other perspective people don't realize is there's a social perspective to what goes on um, with the benefits of being involved in the education system, our graduates at whatever level. But um, first of all, you get reduced social costs that come in the form of um, less absenteeism uh, at work, alcohol abuse, less, less alcohol abuse, I should say, less smoking, low, lower probability of committing crime, and fewer welfare and unemployment claims that are going to be able to come into the area that cost our communities and our businesses all sorts of dollars. So I think if you look at us not only as an educational student trying to provide a class that leads to a degree, but also providing a workforce, a skilled workforce, to be able to come into your environments and uh, go to work, and then what they can contribute to the local community as well as the state is pretty significant. So with that, that's a little bit about 404020 and the benefits of it. So I guess uh, next up, I'm going to turn it over to Linda, who is going to talk about uh, career and technical education, CTE. Good afternoon. I get to say that fully. Yes. I think you could have said good noon. <laughs> that would have been perfect. <laughs> been perfect. I am uh, talking about career and technical education, also referred to as CTE for short, and also STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And, and I also have, whoops, I guess, which one? Okay. And I have three questions that I will answer at some point throughout um, my 10 minutes up here. So CTE stands, as I said, for career and technical education. And how many of you remember vocational education? How many of you still refer to the, our career classes as vocational education? Oh, that's good. <laughs> OK. Um, there's a huge break from what we are doing today with CTE and what had formerly been called vocational education. For um, one thing, vocational education was for a few students. <clears throat> only those students who were not planning to go to college. So they were kind of picked, they were tracked into an area. And the thought was that these would be lower paying jobs. So with career and technical ed, just the opposite is true. We are trying to have a lot of our students go through career and technical ed because it is a rigorous program that starts in high school but ends in an, um, a, high, a certificate after high school or a two-year degree or four-year degree in that area. And it's very important. 
Uh, Obama administration for 2013 uh, proposed a $1.1 billion budget to go into career and technical education, known as the Carl Perkins Grant. And many of our CTE programs are funded through Carl Perkins. And the new Perkins, they've changed too because originally they were all about vocational ed. They're talking about alignment between CTE and the labor market and how to equip students for 21st century education and skills. Talking about strong collaboration among secondary and post-secondary institutions, as you heard Dr. Hay talking about um, our connection now with the 404020. It is causing us to really work closely together into more, in order to make this happen. Meaningful accountability to improve academic outcomes is also a part of career and technical education. So we're talking about technical and employability skills and also making sure that we understand what it is that career and technical ed is. And there's also an increased emphasis on innovation um, so that we can have some good reforms, doing things that will actually make a difference. For example, my vision when I came into Reynolds School District July 1 is that for each and every child we would prepare him or her for a world yet to be discovered. We don't know what is in the future, so how do we plan for that and how do we work with our students and the skills that they need in order to prepare them for those next steps? So that's a little bit about career technical ed. Now let's talk a little bit about STEM, and then I'll talk about how they're connected. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, and Oregon defines this as an approach to teaching and lifelong learning that emphasizes the natural interconnectedness of the four separate STEM disciplines, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. The connections are made explicit through collaboration between educators resulting in real and appropriate context built into instruction, curriculum, and assessment. The common element of problem solving is emphasized across all STEM disciplines, allowing students to discover, explore, and apply critical thinking skills as they learn. So how are they related? So if STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, well, Career and technical ed isn't always about science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we can have some other things, since, it, since um, something like uh, hotel and restaurant management, for example, or culinary arts, doesn't quite fall into the STEM um, definition. But both are career pathways to high wage, high skill, and high demand jobs. Both are connected and interrelated through multiple careers and subject areas. Both um, develop strong problem solving, critical thinking, and project management skills. And both are critical in today's global market, where all of you come in. STEM programs of study are typically classified based on the four occupational clusters computer technology, mathematical sciences, engineering and surveying, and natural, physical, and life sciences. So how does CTE support STEM education? CTE provides clear pathways to STEM careers helping Oregon meet the 40-40-20 goal. CTE provides opportunities to learn critical thinking and problem-solving skills within the STEM context. CTE provides applied learning and high-wage, high-demand, high-skill career preparation in STEM content, and it increases student persistence. Then the next step is how do we benefit, how do these two benefit business and chamber members? There are 1.7 STEM jobs for every unemployed Oregonian. So you think of what is our percentage of unemployment, 1.7 jobs. There are 4.3 unemployed people vying for every one non-STEM job. You see the imbalance. We're talking about the gap. 
So we have people all vying for those careers that are not STEM or CTE related versus the area that we have the need. So that's kind of where education comes in. Fewer than 10% of college careers awarded in Oregon are in STEM fields. So how do we change that? So it is imperative that schools help fill this void. In September 21 of 2012 issue of US News, it provided a list of conclusions about STEM. I'm not gonna read all of them, but just a couple that I think are um, for this area um, in the context. For K-12 students, it's about doing their math homework. Well, that's difficult. How many of you have the kids that you're trying to get to do that math homework? Actually, I think it falls back onto us and how we teach that math and is that math homework relevant. <laughs> students who don't master Algebra 1 by a, the freshman year will have bleak prospects getting a decent job in today's job market. Women, Hispanics, and African Americans are the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity. Often for cultural reasons, they are underrepresented in many of our STEM areas, yet they make up the bulk of the future workforce. Mentor programs have helped change perception of STEM careers, which we are all moving toward. Hands-on learning that links math and science to the real world works best for all students. Online learning and other new technologies show promise but have to be refined and vetted. Combining good teachers with technology may be the game changer. There is a severe shortage of qualified math teachers. The most successful teachers are the ones who are trained the same way they teach by making math and science real life and hands on. And there are many more kids who would like to go into STEM careers than generally recognized, but they aren't properly prepared and most of them drop out. Businesses must be engaged in helping influence the education system for their own good. They need the workers. Schools must listen to the needs of the employers. So there's a collaboration piece that we need. Education must be aligned to the workforce needs, business schools, ties, that involve apprenticeships and co-op learning that result in real jobs are also demonstrating much success. Structured partnerships involving all parts of the community are essential and have been shown to work. Progressive states are encouraging and managing these. So I think we need to look at Oregon and how we are managing those here. Parents should also be aware of why STEM matters to them and their kids. There is no consistency to the various corporate and philo philanthropic messages about why STEM is important. STEM should be marketed as a path to better paying jobs and career stability. Math means money. Parents need to take more responsibility for their children's education. So what impact do CTE and STEM have on our community? With the emphasis on students from underrepresented populations as well as those who may be struggling, we are preparing more students for the world of work. Even those students who struggle in math and science during school can succeed on the job. With perseverance, many people who have had difficulty with early math or science classes can later thrive in a STEM career. So we have to give them the chance through a career-ready workforce high demand, high wage jobs, and the components of a CTE program, which includes communication, problem solving, teamwork, personal management, career development, and employment foundations. Now, let's see. Whoops. Oh, where's the other? What happened to those? Uh-oh. Are they back? Yeah. <laughs> I guess you're going to tell us about that. I guess I, guess <laughs> I will. All right. Well, one of the things I wanted to show you looked something like these slides. 
very pretty with some blue things. <laughs> but it shows what each of our districts are offering our students in our career technical education. So Centennial, Gresham, Reynolds, and Sam Barlow all offer early childhood development. Um, Centennial, Gresham, and Sam Barlow offer accounting. Centennial and Reynolds and Sam Barlow offer culinary arts. Gresham, Reynolds, and Sam Barlow offer wood manufacturing. Centennial, Reynolds, and Sam Barlow offer metals manufacturing. Gresham and Reynolds offer automotive technology. Centennial and Reynolds offer business management. Um, Sam Barlow offers architectural drawing. And Sam Barlow also offers event planning and graphic arts. Gresham offers integrated media. Reynolds offers graphic arts. Um, Sam Barlow offers fashion marketing. And then Reynolds offers computer science, computer applications, construction, and principles of engineering. Um, I would like to also mention, this is a plug for Reynolds, <laughs> so I'll say it. We are starting a Project Lead the Way program at Reynolds High School, and Project Lead the Way is focused definitely on STEM and engineering. There are two different strands for Project Lead the Way. One is engineering and one is biomedical. We're going to start out with the engineering strand first. And some of the courses that we will be offering, the, our first course is going to be principles of engineering, but the others are going to be introduction to engineering design, digital electronics, computer integrated manufacturing, civil engineering and architecture, engineering design and development, biotechnical engineering, and aerospace engineering. Um, these are hands-on, high, of high interest to kids, and we just got a grant so that we can use this grant in order to teach our teachers how to most effectively teach these classes. So at this point now, um, talking more about CTE, will be uh, Dr. Hay. Um, just back to CTE at the community college level, um, <clears throat> we have a number of things going on in that area, all of which uh, capitalize on the STEM initiatives Linda was talking about. Uh, we take that science, technology, engineering, math very seriously, and math is a significant effort for us as well. I mentioned the, width, the span of my student body. The other thing about my student body is the average age coming into the college is about 30 years old, plus or minus a little bit. And so we have an older student on, by and large, even though I have that larger span. Well, a lot of them are coming back for a variety of reasons. They've been out of college for, or out of school of any sort for quite a while. Uh, they may not even have a degree. I think, what was the number? Of about 11% of our students are, what was your number again? Right. So 11% of Oregonians 25 years or older do not have a high school degree or a GED. So we see a lot of those students coming in. We see another batch of students that are coming in that were very successful getting an AA or a BA or something like that, but they don't have a career. They don't have jobs and what have you. And they come back to the college looking for new directions about where they're going to go. Uh, they're looking for jobs on a personal level and how they can best fit in and where things are going. So when it comes to our career in technical education, we concentrate on three sectors primarily with a few other things thrown in there. The three sectors are prim primarily allied health, manufacturing, and technology. When you look at our allied health programs, we run a significant number of programs oriented towards just about every aspect of, of the health professions with the exception of developing doctors. We may be the early stages of developing those doctors, but uh, we have a nursing program, respiratory care, surgical technology, physical therapy, and all those kinds of things that are part of that health profession uh, situation. It all relies on those STEM courses that we're talking about here. On the manufacturing level is another area we po focus on. We have uh, metals programs, welding, uh, manufacturing, and, um, you know, 
machining, I guess is the other word I want there, uh, that we do there. And we also have auto shop. You know, the, the old days, as Linda talked about, you know, that was kind of one of the premier vocational ed kinds of courses. Now it's one of the most sophisticated courses you can get involved in with technology and computers. And, you know, I, there's a number of uh, manufacturers back in Germany that I'm aware of. They send all their techs from all over the world back to Germany for seminars every year. And these seminars are pretty rigorous seminars. We're not just talking about knuckle crunch or doing a wrench or something, but it's a lot of computer work associated with it. Um, so we have those. And then the third area is the technology area, and we're developing more and more programs that look like cybersecurity, that look like uh, healthcare informatics, that look like gaming. And those are kind of current directions people are starting to go with technology and where they're starting to happen. We also offer engineering. We offer architectural, uh, civil, and mechanical engineering. So we have two directions people go out of that. They begin apprenticeship type of programs uh, in businesses and go right to work and or they go on to the universities to finish up their degrees in those areas. Um, we also have um, uh, sustainability type of programs that help people. We have the, um, um, the hospitality and tourism industry. Uh, we help out, help out a little bit and that helps. Then we go on, we have another area we call workforce uh, development and community education. With workforce development, uh, we also have a significant number of programs there, and we partner up with businesses like Danner, like Leatherman, like uh, Boeing, uh, that we come in here. We partner with the city when they have developmental businesses starting to come in. Uh, there was a new power plant type of situation coming in the area, and we, uh, there was a award just made, but we were partnering up with part of them pre their coming here to provide the educational opportunity they needed for their employers. Um, we also are um, developing what we call career pathway programs. So sort of what Linda indicated here about various types of areas up there, we notice that there is a progression of uh, competencies employers are looking for, and so we provide those steps along the way. We might do them in accounting or other things. We have some coming up right now, uh, a new one being offered here in uh, Autodesk. Uh, which is an in-demand Corsair, and in our future we'll be adding Autodesk Inventor. So we try to help with those progression steps. Um, I was told uh, Bonneville Dam to get to one of their engineer level people up there, Bonneville Power uh, Company and all. They've got 17 steps of progression competencies they want to see from an individual get there. And we, through our, um, our program, we can start to help people step that way. Maybe not complete it all the way, but we can provide those steps that put people to work. And then um, finally, we also have a small business development center where we teach all sorts of courses to um, uh, people as well as counseling and advising to support people coming through and being able to move on, to create their own business, to enhance their business and move that in. And again, that ties into lots of other programs that we um, have around there. And then finally, uh, I'll take you back to that beginning with 11% of those students, we do have adult basic skills where we help uh, and help that progression of people that are coming back to college, back to our institution, to try to move on and begin to be successful in college, you know, get them to the GED point and help move them into the AA level and find progressive areas. And then one area, other area I mentioned is we're also doing it in uh, vocational ESL types of programs. So we have some of these career pathways for non-English speaking people uh, to come in and develop their uh, English proficiency as well as become a welder or something along those lines. So those are turned out to be quite good also. So that's probably enough for me. Sam uh, is going to be talking about ACE. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sam Breyer. I am in my first year as Superintendent Centennial, but I've had the pleasure of working in this community for 13 years now. So um, I can say as a first year uh, superintendent, I'm really excited with the direction this conversation is taking, not just in this room, but in the state in general. Um, the recognition that uh, public education and business are not separate concepts or even opposing concepts as is sometimes presented, but really um, we're really tightly linked there. Um, and I see, and I know my fellow panelists see it as well, part of our job really is economic development. And as someone committed deeply to um, the Centennial community and Gresham and Portland as well, um, these concepts are critical to that. And for our students, our primary um, purpose is to get students through our system and be successful beyond that. It doesn't really do a lot of good if we do our best work, they all get high school diplomas, and then nothing happens afterwards. So. Um, 
These conversations are critical for that, um, and particularly in the CTE areas, um, we're missing a lot of opportunities. We've heard in this room several times again about there are a lot of really good jobs there where the workforces are aging out, and there aren't, um, there isn't a pipeline or a preparation for those things. And so, in order to really elevate our communities and our businesses together at the same time, it's critical that we fill some of those roles. And there was a time, as we've heard before, where most of our high schools and most high schools in general had metal shops auto shop, woods programs, all of those things. And there were problems in that sometimes those became tracking and limiters to students, but now we're missing an opportunity to expose students to the concept that there are really good jobs there. And some students um, who should absolutely be prepared for college may choose to go a different route and have a successful um, career and, and a living wage for their family. And so I'm excited today to be able to talk to you about um, an innovative partnership that um, your school districts are um, in around ACE Academy. So ACE Academy, ACE is Architecture, Construction, and Engineering. It's a partnership between the three school districts represented here and the Park Road School District. And those programs that um, we've unfortunately cut in times of budget cuts and things around wood shop and construction, those are um, expensive to run, and once they're cut, they're prohibitively expensive to add back. Yet it's important that our students have those exposure. And so uh, we have partnered together in a way that allows our students to have that and still um, gather all the skills that they need in order to go on to college should they choose. So ACE is actually a pathway where students get exposure to the design build industry and have the choice afterwards and still leave um, with all the skills they need for college and a standard high school diploma from their home high school. So in order to do that, they attend our school's half day and ACE half day, and it is a joint charter school concept. And it's really simple. This is all it is. I, I just laugh. I put that in there because that reminds me of that famous NATO slide about, oh, everything's simple and goes like that. Basically, what this, the bottom half of this is saying what they would need to do to have their academic skills, and the top where they split out is the exposure to the design build, but I will make it a little more simple than that. Um, so the programs that they offer are architecture, and in that, um, that's based on um, found a, uh, the elements of architecture as established by uh, the Chicago Architecture Foundation. Students in that get exposure to key concepts in architecture and also work with industry standard tools. They're currently using Autodesk Revit in there um, to have that. Um, or they can choose to go down the construction and trades pathways, and there they get exposure to a lot of... Um, really high quality careers in the construction industry. Um, within that, they also focus on workplace safety. We all know for um, economic purposes, that's really a key area that our employees have is the ability and um, the emphasis on safety because we know the cost when time is lost due to work um, force injury. And of course, um, within that, it's not just about the trades. They also get exposure to um, concepts of management and entrepreneurship in terms of construction. Um, and for engineering, um, it is an intro to the study. It is also through Project Lead the Way. The ACE um, curriculum is built around that. And Project Lead the Way is a um, national project. And 60% of students who enter engineering in college end up dropping that course before um, completing it. Graduates of Project Lead the Way, that actually drops down to 15%. So it's a strong approach that, again, is really preparing students who make that choice to have success afterwards. Um, this is a representative of how ACE really is a partnership across all of our districts. Um, students from all schools in our district as well as Park Rose. We even have some homeschoolers who choose to access ACE for part of their education because of the quality of the program. Um, and while it doesn't exactly, exactly represent the ethnicity of um, our districts as they exist now, it does represent all ethnicities. Um, one area that we are working on is currently uh, it's a four to one male to female ratio at ACE and that's a goal of the ACE board and the program itself is to increase the uh, number of female students there and we've made some pretty significant progress with that this year. ACE really truly is a partnership. It's a great example of the link between our education and industry. Um, on the board itself, uh, the four public school superintendents sit, and then we have representatives from um, industry, including AGC, um, the Electrical Workers Unions, Hoffman, the Oregon Building Congress, um, Soderstrom Architects, and then Portland General Electric also has a representative, as well as a parent of a student there. And it really is an exciting partnership, 
and it's a challenging partnership because that's where the uh, public um, public education and industry we really do um, get to push and pull each other in terms of <laughs> educating students and also really meeting those industry standards there. So it's a, an exciting piece. Um, it's also a partnership in another way in that many of these industries step up to the plate and provide training space or links. Students at ACE actually have a capstone project that they need to complete, which requires that they um, develop a project at the end and that they have an industry-linked mentor to that. And so real quickly, I'll just click through here a few. These are examples of where ACE students are actually out on site at these places in their training shops or working with real industry representatives. So um, the ACE Academy experience really provides our students with that hands-on project-based learning, exposure to um, potential careers in the design-build industry, industry mentors, strong links there, um, and preparation for success. Uh, one thing I meant to emphasize but somehow completely forgot to mention is the entire curriculum really is embedded in, embedded in workplace skills as well. So even should they not choose to um, go into design-build, these are students who've had those skills kind of drilled into them that we all know and we hear from the employers again and again. I can train the person if they show up on time, if they have those soft skills, those pieces. And th this is really an example for them to get those in the context of some real workplace training. So these students come out prepared to be successful in college or in your places of employment if they need to be. Um, industry partners, of course, this is a beginning of a pipeline for some of these where these are students who have had exposure to the concepts, who do know whether they really want to work in that hands-on creative design type environment or not. Um, and of course, for our community, it really is a true partnership between uh, K-12 and industry, which is absolutely as it should be, as I said when I opened. Um, and these graduates are prepared to come and be your employees or to receive the training necessary to be your employees. So ACE is really an exciting, um, innovative, uh, innovative concept that we are really partnering on and we hope to expand. And we actually have another example of that, which Jim Schachter will now speak to now. Thanks, Sam. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm batting cleanup, so your chance to ask us questions is just around the corner. I, I want to recognize in the audience Mark Reith. Uh, Mark is actually instrumental uh, working out of Mount Hood, but working for all of the districts to integrate the Perkins grant and the dollars that are spent on professional development for the teachers of those classes. And that's no small task. And so we've been appreciated for taking the time to join us and listen to this. I wanted to mention a few things uh, to back up a little bit. We were talking about vocational ed versus CTE. Uh, in my day, vocational ed quite often was what we called hobby shop classes, where you'd make a sleeve press out of wood and give it to your mother for Christmas, and then you'd walk out feeling like you knew something about woodworking. Those courses really don't exist anymore. Uh, the requirements of our high school graduates now, the number of credits and the specificity with which those are high academic content does not allow the time in the student day to take hobby shop. If they're going to take a course, such as something in woods or metals, those courses have been redesigned to meet state standards around writing, around math, around speaking. So all of our courses are very rigorous in terms of what they require of our students. So that's what's changed in high school, if you haven't been there for a while, and why we don't call it voc -ed anymore. Uh, as CTE, these are really challenging courses for all. Before I go into Cal, I will mention, and I think the numbers are similar in the other high schools, two-thirds of our students are enrolled in a CTE course. So it's not like we're talking about a small group of students who have access to these courses. Two-thirds of our kids currently in the three high schools that are in our district are in a CTE course of some sort. But a lot of those students are getting, uh, taking advantage of the STEM kind of classes through ACE, and I want to talk about Cal. Uh, Cal is the predecessor to ACE. It's been around for 10 years now. It stands for the Center for Advanced Learning. And really the, the description here for Cal is a couple of key things. One is project-based. The number of times I've talked with those of you out there in business to say, I, I need people who can work in groups and, and solve problems and communicate well. The entire curriculum at Cal is set up around that model to say students don't sit in groups of 40 listening to someone direct them. They need to work in small groups to solve problems, and that's what this school is set up to do. It also has a lot to do with internships, getting students into the community to learn from business and, and from industry. And finally, it continues to do what, what ACE does, Sam mentioned, it keeps them connected to their home high school. 
no, no matter how worthy your science, technology, engineering goals for students, for most of them, if they cannot continue to connect to their home high school, to play in the band, to be in sports, and to talk to kids in the hallway, they won't go. So these are unique charter arrangements, partnerships, that give kids the best of both worlds. These uh, unique kind of high-end academic courses plus the home high school experience. When you take a look at Cal, a couple of the key programs there, and then there's just a few things related to them. Information technology and networking and computing or digital media design, that's one kind of wing of the building, so to speak. Manufacturing and mechanical engineering, as opposed to the design build type that you see over at ACE. And then the most popular part is probably the health sciences and medical and dental professions, uh, where we have, for example, currently 120 of the seniors will be doing what they call their clinicals throughout the, the region in hospitals, clinics, those kinds of places. So they're getting that, that uh, kind of experience. Larger than ACE because it's older and it has grown, but roughly 500 students. You can see what high schools they come from. We're a little heavy on the female side at Cal. That's primarily the med medical dental side. Tends to attract a, a large population of, of women into our schools. Uh, so that's who is there. Uh, probably fairly representative of the white, non-white, just some of the data we're running about 27% uh, minority within it. And again, like ACE, uh, we're trying to make sure that this school represents the normal population of the, of the communities we serve. We'd like to have equal representation. So how does the educational program relate to business and chamber? Well, we engage with business and chamber members. Our board, like the ACE board, has the superintendents and the president of Mount Hood, but it also has a rep, someone from Toyotanzo, from Metro East, and Owens Corning, people who sit on that board from industry. Program partners, meaning they interact with students in some way in terms of whether it's internships or sometimes it's providing materials or supporting trips, uh, particularly mechanical and engineering. We have Boeing and Autodesk, Information Tech, Metro East, ITT Tech, and I won't read through that health science list. But you can see those students are connected throughout the community in their internships and partnerships. What does the program do for our community? Well, one, it gets these kids more ready for either entry into the workforce or the ability to achieve that higher education so they can come back to the community. One of the things that I know just from, from my going around to the 19 schools in our district is I will quite often test with the people that I talk to how many of them graduated from one of our schools. The majority have. We live in, in an, a desirable area in the Portland metro area where our high school graduates do come back to work. I grew up in a small rural town in Colorado and the joke there is that you know 90 percent of us leave and you never come back because there's very little opportunity if you're not a wheat farmer. Gresham and the Gresham area offers a full range of employment and opportunities in a very desirable place. So what our high school graduate, graduates leave with is important because they will want to come back and live here and be a part of this community. So what we do provide college university credit, there's six classes that give four credit lower division classes that they can go into Oregon State or U of O or wherever and it's like money in the bank. They leave Cal with those. There's also 10 dual credit classes where there's one to five credits that will transfer directly into Mount Hood and many other colleges. So students are beginning to meet that expectation in the 40-40-20 plan is that an increasing number of high school students attain college credit while they're in high school. And why is that important? If they're successful in high school attaining college credit, they believe they can be successful in college and will enroll. It's the student who has never taken on the challenge of a college course that quite often will never take on college as an option. So that's one of the reasons we're, we're looking for those dual credit classes and, and those sorts of things. With that, it's time for some questions and answers. Well, questions, we may have answers. And uh, probably the best way, I'm going to just guess that a lot of, how are you going to do this? Oh, okay. Well, Allison does that. Uh, if you have one of us in particular you would like to take on your question, say that. If not, I'll hand it to somebody, or Allison will. Yeah. You want me to just stay here? That doesn't mean I'm not going to ask you to answer. Okay. I'm Deanna Haley with the Boeing Company, and I make 
I, one of the, my jobs with Boeing is our charitable giving, and so we've been investing in STEM in the school districts here, but I am curious. Um, I did make an investment last year in the Portland Metro STEM, and I think only Park Rose was involved. So can you comment? Are you guys thinking of getting involved in that? Are you familiar with that? I'm not. One of the areas with STEM, and as I believe, depending upon how the legislature continues, is they're looking for some additional funding for investment in STEM by school districts to explore how to expand that. So we're in the process of kind of monitoring that to see where there's some seed dollars. I'm not familiar with the Portland Metro STEM. Until it's operated. Okay. And but you had to pay to play. You had to put yeah. money up. And I was disappointed there wasn't really any East County schools for me to partner with. Except for Park Rose was the only one I think gave a little bit of money. And I'm just saying it's an opportunity maybe you should look at. Let's talk some more. Okay. <laughs> we will not want to pass up any of those such opportunities. Um, for any of you at the K-12 level, um, can you talk about how you start getting kids um, interested and involved from elementary school on in participating in these sorts of programs? I'll take a little bit of this and then I'll let one of you step. You know, I'll be honest with you, I think it's increasingly challenging. One of the, I think, not unintended consequences of over-reliance on testing over the last decade has put our elementary schools in a position of needing to be successful primarily in language arts and math. As a former middle and high school science teacher, uh, I struggle sometimes with the de-emphasis on science in our elementary schools because I think their minds are just ready for it. That doesn't mean a lot of our teachers aren't effective in delivering science content through the other subjects, but I think that's one of the challenges we're continuing to try to wrestle with. Coming around the corner soon, you'll hear about something called Smarter Balanced Assessment, which is the new way of testing that you'll see evolve over the next three years. What is good about that is it's much more centered on the higher order thinking skills, problem solving, inquiry, those sorts of things. And as those skills become more in demand on a test, you naturally will do a better job of integrating them into the curriculum. So I think there, there's going to be a shift away from that low level knowledge that you see on the current state test to a much higher level knowledge that because of the content delivered there at a higher level gets the interest going. Because I, I, I personally believe elementary school is where you need to trigger the, the science mind. Uh, and so when they come into middle school, they're reared up and ready to go and, and do more. You want to take a shot at that, Sam? Well, I can. Jim said most of what I was going to say, but I guess I would add to that that in terms of the conversation in general, um, this really is moving the right direction. And education, public education, is in a huge flux right now with Smarter Balance. You've probably heard a lot about the Common Core state standards, which are almost a national level of standards. And both of those things really are about more project-based, problem-solving type learning, which is the way that we need to go in order to actually be preparing an effective workforce. And so I think those pieces just naturally lend to that. I will also add that Centennial, we're in conversation with a group called um, Pathways to Manufacturing, which is a partnership with Impact Northwest um, and some other pieces. And the idea there is that we will be a seed or model program in terms of how we start exposing students earlier to some of these career concepts out there. And so we're working on that now, too. And Jim told me to stay up here if there are any other questions. So I'll turn it over to Linda when someone asks something. <laughs> I'm Joan Albertson with AAUW and also live in the Centennial School District. Uh, AAUW has been advocating for STEM education for about 20 years or so. Something that we started discovering within the several years ago, 10, 10 to 20 years ago, was that many women were graduating in these fields from college. They would get a job, there were no mentors. And then they would become discouraged and go off and do jewelry making or something. Uh, and from my own experience, when I was starting out, having clients, having other people in the field that were established that would lend you a hand, give you some encouragement, it was so important. I was delighted to hear all of you mentioning mentoring. Got off easy. That wasn't a question. Thank you. <laughs> I have two in front of me. My name is Shirley Craddock. Um, one of you mentioned the, the importance of having the parents engage in this and be part of this. And I, I know that we know from history that 
uh, parents that are engaged, the children are likely to be much more successful in school. And when it's a value in the home that you have an education, you go on to college, the kids are much more likely to, to do that. So how, what, are your, what are your plans, thoughts, on how we're going to get more parents actively engaged in the children's education? So much of it now is left to the school districts to do this, and the parents kind of step out and don't play an active role. So do you have any current active plans that you're going to try to engage the families, the parents, particularly on, on parents where there's a, a, only one parent in the family and they're so busy just trying to earn a living, mm -hmm. they don't have time to, uh, to give to the children, you know, with, at least as it relates to school. And, and I think that really is the million dollar question or billion dollar question that we're all facing right now and is part of the emphasis of the Achievement Compact process under the Governor's 40-40-20 is how we get parents involved in this. And I think, um, I know Linda had something she wanted to say too. I also want to emphasize in terms of when we're talking about career jobs other than college, I think we've done a really or we're doing a better and better job all the time of emphasizing college as a choice for all of our students, particularly as our low-income students. But what we're also seeing with a program like ACE is um, enrollment is not always as high as we would expect, given that we know that's a clear pathway afterwards. And some of that is we're seeing that families don't have that concept of those jobs as being good long-term career jobs. So some of the partnering there is about getting um, the parents into those schools and into those programs to see that it is a viable long-term Success, for, um, success path for their students. So that's a really important piece. In terms of engaging our community and working with students in general, um, I think we all are reaching out to our families and our community as much as possible in order to do that and working to include them more in the decisions within the school district. I know in Centennial we're really opening up the decision-making process um, to our parents to sit in there and looking for innov innovative ways, again, starting at elementary school, that parents are coming in and we're actually, instead of just the old um, piece where they come in and you tell them what their kids are doing, we bring parents in and have conversations with them about how they can support their students learning at home and many times they say I really want to help my kid with this but now with the new rigor of Common Core and everything else sometimes they don't know what to do particularly in the area of math so more and more I think you'll see us providing some education to parents in, in order to support their students that they're educating as well and I know Linda had something she wanted to add so she gets the mic now <laughs> it's like playing hot potato or something um, one of the things that we have been doing, um, we have about 49% uh, of our parents are Latino, and we have um, collaborated with Salem-Kaiser Coalition of Equality, who are coming into our schools and offering parent um, training and workshops on how to best support their children. So we're also in a high poverty area, so we have a lot of parents who probably don't have jobs or are going from one job to another, and it's very difficult for them to be able to support their children when they do not know or understand um, the direction that they need to be discussing these things with their children. But um, we have really opened up our doors to our Latino families coming in to give them that training so that they can better serve the kids because that's usually where our dropout rate is. Um, and there's disengagement um, between home and school. So we're trying to make sure that we tighten that engagement for, for both. So every one of our schools have had um, a couple of different Latino parent nights already. Um, we are offering classes, and the classes actually are to train parents how to train others. So we'll have a core group of parents who will be learning all of the information that needs to be shared, and then they in turn will be going to each one of our schools and training other parents on how to work with their children. So it's, it's doing the, helping with the reading, it's helping with the math, and just learning some of those basic skills. I think we have another wrinkle on it. Um, I told you my average age is 30 years old, so we have a lot of parents that are also students as well coming through. And one of the cha most challenging courses when we do all our placement tests and everything is the math. And so we have a lot of efforts uh, in our adult basic skills and our other kinds of areas around there at developmental programs 
to bring people along that math curriculum and in turn pass it on to their kids and their students. So when you get around some of our Head Start programs, we have a lot of parents engaged and involved in various programs that we try to include them in and uh, you know take it down to their students that they're working with too. So it's sort of that continuum again of moving along in life as they become parents and what do they do to try to engage. So since I'm standing, I'll yeah. take the next one. Hi, uh, my name is Tara Bowen Biggs, and I work for Multnomah County Commissioner Diane McKeel. Um, Diane is very excited about the possibility of STEM as a community and economic development driver and workforce development as well. We've been talking about it a lot in our office and how we might uh, be able to plug into the efforts that are uh, already going on. We think that exposing kids um, to STEM fields and STEM professionals early and often is a great prevention tool. Um, we are interested in helping facilitate some of those structured partnerships that Superintendent Flores um, uh, mentioned in when you were speaking uh, so that the East Metro area is known as a strong STEM community. And so my question for you is, um, who, are, who are the best people to contact in your districts um, to make sure that the school districts are represented in our, in our discussions? I could make it easy for you by just giving you my card, <laughs> and then you can pass it on to the right people. Um, but I, I would like to know if you guys have any thoughts about ways that um, you know, the government could come in and help facilitate some of these, um, uh, some of these possibilities. I think that was to you. Does anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, a couple of things, just to back up a little bit on STEM. Some of you may have heard it, it stated as STEAM on occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually started not in Oregon, but Rudy Crew, who uh, is working in the state, has mentioned STEAM. And if you add A after the E for the arts, you would have STEAM. And I bring that up because our three districts uh, have stronger arts programs than most of those in the Portland metro area or in the state. In spite of, no doubt, reductions in some of the offerings, you will still see very strong bands, choirs, orchestras, visual arts programs in all of our high schools. So the role of the arts in thinking and student success cannot be understated. So even though the, the going language is STEM, uh, certainly in this part of the, of the woods out here in East Metro, we recognize the arts as also being critical in the development of students and their way of thinking. So that's been real strong. Marty Stevens with AAUW. <coughs> Excuse me. Traditionally, women are underrepresented in, underrepresented in the, especially the engineering field. What are your districts doing to attract uh, females into the en engineering courses? I think it goes back to, in, in the two cases of both ACE and Cal, uh, one of the things as those schools go into our high schools to recruit students for those programs, a lot of times the, the attempt is to give them role models. So at ACE Academy, for example, the, the architect who's from Soderstrom is a woman and she has made herself available to go into our high schools as we talk to sophomores about enrolling in ACE as a role model of someone who can be an architect, not necessarily an engineer in this case, but women in these fields need to go and connect with people. Also, the students who do attend that are females uh, are used a lot to recruit their peers. Um, it's a challenge, though, I will tell you, particularly at ACE, it has, uh, in its short span, picked up a very male feel to it and so a lot of attention is being given to even with the instructors is uh, an awareness of how best to teach to both genders because if you get a, a room that's dominated by males people start to behave differently and so it's that attentiveness <laughs> well yeah but you know as a teacher you can become insensitive to the position of those who are in a strong minority in terms of how they learn so I think a lot of it has to do with the way we deliver instruction to students. But I'll go back to elementary. If elementary kids are jazzed about science and math, it doesn't matter what gender they are. It's cool to be in science as a girl in elementary. Where they run into trouble is they get into high school. We have to make it continue to be cool for those kids. I'm Kathy Ruthruff. I'm on Gresham Barlow's school board. And I have a question for you and also the audience. You've seen some of these uh, uh, schools we have and programs we have right now, 
what do you want next? What's the next hole? What's the next area do you feel we need to start focusing on? Because I'm, I'm a pusher, so once you get one done, I'm, you know, I'm ready to look at the next one. And Jim knows that as well. So I'll ask all of you in, up, up front, where do we go next? Well, I'll, I'll go first, and I'll, I'll let others speak. We had a uh, community forum, which I know other districts have as well, or an education summit, we called it. We asked that question a lot of folks. And certainly the areas that we're in now are of high interest. But there's a lot of other ones. You know, just two, for two examples, automotive and welding. Where are those opportunities through our high schools? We certainly don't have as much of that. We have an automotive class in one of our high schools. But that, is that the next academy? Uh, like Cal or ACE, where you look into some of those other kind of career path choices and go there. But, but you know, ACE and Cal were uh, the result of incredible work by a lot of folks, not just the school districts, but by industry partners. So what are those industries that are under, underrepresented in terms of what our kids have access to in high school, and do we come together to talk about that? Uh, I think that's an important piece is to find out what does the community want? What what areas are missing in our high schools in terms of this kind of, particularly if we go the academy route, which says junior, senior year focus? Uh, because those are really high-end courses at Cal and ACE in terms of academic content. It's not just, you know, how do you turn welding into a high academic content course? I think it's possible, but it would take some work. Rather than answering that, I think with specific content, I'll, I'll respond with the concept that I think you'll definitely see. And that's in terms of both ACE and Cal are really a regional collaboration piece. And I think they're good models for where we are now. Um, I think the next step really is um, increasing the regional partnership. And I think the, particularly the link with Mount Hood Community College in terms of all of our school districts and the college being tightly linked so that um, right now, in many places, there's a break. Even if we build a pipeline at the high school, there's a break there at the um, community college and then a break within industry. So having the regional level and the convening of that conversation so we can work directly with industry. Welding is a perfect example. You know, we try, we've tried starting welding programs, and then they aren't the right ones, those kind of things. So working um, in terms of collaboration with K-12, the community college, and industry um, for what the next program is is an important concept. Would anyone else care to comment? Because we're just about out of time. I'm thinking um, when it goes back to my vision for each and every child prepared for a world yet to be imagined is we don't know what it's going to look like even, you know, two years from now or four years from now. Um, students starting college, the technology that they're learning, it's already become archaic by the time they graduate. So I think we really have to put our energy into our problem solving and critical thinking because we do have to prepare them for that world yet to be imagined and it's a technology, <laughs> you're on the train for technology I think. Um, when you're talking about welding, you know, it's not the old fashioned kind of welding. Um, we're talking, you know, highly sophisticated. Can we do that in, in our current school systems? So. We really have to prepare kids for that highly technological world that's out there just waiting um, and growing very fast. So um, we're talking about change, and we're talking about um, making quick change in a very short time. So that is what we have to be prepared for, <laughs> constant change and being able to make that happen. If we're going to get back to that 40-40-20, if we do what we're doing now, we're going to have exactly the same outcomes in 2025. That means between now and 2025, we need to make some vast changes in the way we teach our children and prepare them. And that, I think, is what you're going to be seeing in the next 10 years, those vast changes really starting, because we have to do things differently, or we will still have exactly the same results. That's not a very good note to end. <laughs> However, I was very delighted being here today and meeting so many of you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our speakers today. I think this is a very, very important and stimulating conversation that we all need to think about how business and education is going to partner to meet those goals, which are very 
very high and aggressive, but that we need to do, or we are going to have a problem. As, as Linda said, we'll be doing the same thing, but doing it badly. And so think about how we, as the business community, can support education, and how can we let them know what programs are needed to help um, bridge that skills gap. So that's our responsibility as the business community that I put to you um, to, to create relationships with those sitting at this table and to go deeper. So thank you very much for being here today. Please uh, take a moment to fill out the evaluation form on your table. We just hold that up, Mark. Um, there's, they're right at your seat, so if you could do that, we'd really appreciate it. We also have a basket with business cards, and um, we'll draw one out, and the winner will have a, the next government affairs program on us. You want to draw that? Sure. And that would be Carla Sines with the American Cancer Association or Society. Is she here still? Perfect. Um, our next programming um, in April will be the Metro Parks and Natural Lands Levy Conversation. And with us will be, um, again, Shirley Craddock and also Metro President Tom Hughes. And um, um, Matt Wand is going to speak, uh, former state rep Manuel will speak um, to, on the pros and cons. We're doing a point-counterpoint presentation on the levy. In May, our topic will be what federal and state health care reform means to you and your business. Um, and we have a speaker named Tim Rash from the Government Affairs Director of the Oregon Association of Healthcare Underwriters. So those are two things that are very important to our region. I'd also like to note that um, thank you to Riverview Community Bank. You may take your coffee cup with you if you would like to exit with that today. And just on the last note, um, there is a book that has been cycling through in the chamber industry um, in my peer circle called The Coming Jobs War. And I would suggest that you all take a look at that book because it does talk about this gap between education, skills, and, and our workforce for the future. So take a uh, pick, pick up that book and take a look at it because it's a very sobering view of where we are headed educationally. So with that, I thank you all for being here today, and we hope to see you next month. Mm -hmm.